a study undertaken by the network of public interest lawyers on police reforms has called for the overhaul of the current police leadership, which should be replaced with competent officers of proven integrity and ability to enforce discipline. If implemented, this study could breathe life into what critics view as an unprofessional, lethargic police force under military capture. Public trust in the police force continues to languish in the basement 22 years after Justice Julia Sevutinde's report, amongst others, unraveled incriminating evidence implicating senior police officers to the criminal underworld. For instance, Sebutinde discovered that some officers had participated in robberies and others destroyed evidence that could have led to the prosecution of murder suspects. She also recommended for the improvement in the welfare and salaries of police officers. But most of her recommendations, including those that adversely named senior police officers and demanded their resignation, were shelved on the premise that they lacked incriminating evidence. The force currently under the leadership of Martin Okotho Chola, hailed by Sebutinde as an honest man, faces a legitimacy crisis as it attempts to shrug the shackles of military capture. The study titled Reflections on the Progress of the Implementation of Civilian Oversight Police Reform Initiatives in Uganda observes that citizen trust in the police force continues to diminish as the president has used every opportunity at his disposal to disparage the institution as incompetent and infiltrated with criminals. The study also reveals that there are undertones of disgruntlement relating to recruitment, favoritism in promotions based on allegations of ethnicity and nepotism, and general disparities in deployment, amongst other challenges, continue to filter through the corridors of the institution. During the NRM government, three reform initiatives have been undertaken, including the Justice Ordered Commission of Inquiry into Human Rights Violations between 1962 and 1986, the Justice Julia Sebutinde Judicial Commission of Inquiry into Corruption in the Police Force, and the 2010-2011 police review process. It's a study then that looks at uh, the various police reforms that have been uh, uh, proposed uh, formally, but also informally, but mainly those that have come through formal processes, including legislative processes from 1986 through climaxing legislatively in 1995 when the constitution was uh, promulgated a number of uh, changes taking place in the positioning of the police within the architecture of the of the state but also a number of reforms that have come through through two channels one through commissions of inquiry those of you that are old enough like myself you remember the 17 day commission and how exciting it was to and i quote it is not enough for these internal police accountability mechanisms to exist but they must be transparent, accessible, and unless justifiable circumstances demand their deliberations on specific cases of accountability they are handling must be made public. Close quotes. The study's lead researcher James Kube observes, adding, and I quote, This is important not only to send the desired deterrent effect to other police officers on the likely consequences of unprofessionalism and breach of the police standing orders, but also more fundamentally to elicit mutual trust within the citizenry in the institutions and its ability to discipline its officers. I close quote. Uh, the, the caribou of the people that are being recruited these days, I'm sorry with the due respect, are lacking. And that's why the aspect of discipline, professionalism, is really uh, has a daunting task to really address. Uh, there should be a systematic way of, first of all, uh, the recruits, the people who come in an institution, 
they should be thoroughly vetted. You don't get somebody who has been rejected in society, like the forces in the 70s. They would say, ah, this fellow is disturbing us. Then they, even 79, those who joined the army, many of them were ex-criminals then, and they joined the uh -huh. uh, And of now, uh, it is not a surprise. You have very many drug addicts in the institution. You have so many thugs in the institution. Former robbers. Yeah, criminals in the institution. And I thought, that's why I said it should cut across. Not only in police, prisons, army, in intelligence civil service. service, civil service. But these days, the challenge is the study argues that the openness of such mechanisms is important to fairness and justice for the accused, considering that sometimes these mechanisms are used as witch hunt platforms of junior officers against senior officers to settle personal and known scores. These reforms, in his view, are more pronounced to salvage situations of general poor management and organization of the police institution often common in post-conflict countries and regions within a country transitioning to normalcy after decades of peace fragility and insecurity and no accountability. And I quote, this is true of Uganda's turbulent history and more recently in certain regions like Northern Uganda, Karamoja region and Kasese region where the Lord's Resistance Army, the Kato Rustlers, and allied democratic forces, rebel stroke terror group, respectively, have sustained civil wars and insecurity against the civilians, the report observes. Uh, that sometimes the internal mechanisms of police discipline can, can be weak, or actually could be non-existent, especially in post-conflict countries like ourselves. Okay, yes, someone could say we have been stable, but we are just coming out of a conflict in some parts of the country. So when this happens, some institutions naturally uh, will become weak, or some institutions will become almost, uh, you know, extinct. Those of you who had an opportunity to be in northern Uganda uh, at the aftermath of the war, you recognize that actually uh, the police took a long, long shot at re-establishing themselves because the region had become entirely militarized for obvious reasons. So same thing in Karamoja, you know, and I think since 2007, we have just seen uh, a, a rebirth of police uh, within uh, Karamoja. I was privileged to be on a trip with the uh, now retired uh, Assistant Inspector uh, Kasinji, where he was actually, you know, launching uh, a police station uh, in, in a beam. The lead researcher profiles that reforms could increase public confidence in the police, noting that it may elicit faith and trust in the police. Besides, it equips the public with the confidence to lodge more complaints about police officers the moment there's a semblance of a fair and transparent process of holding the errant officers accountable. But also, the action of civilian oversight is consistent with a quest for rule of law and participatory democracy, where the consumers of services of the police, the citizenry, take part in its governance. Who appoints the Inspector General of Police? The President. And who, who renews the contracts? The President. Not only him, not only the IGP, but also the the deputy and all the directors, yeah, and all of us. I was promoted in July this year. Who promoted me? <laughs> so that means to promote me evaluates my performance, and he must be happy with the performance. And then he will say, come here, can be promoted. If he is not happy, I will not be promoted. He will promote those others he's happy with. So you are creating a force which you want to be very independent, but you are putting it under the, the whims of, of the executive. And it's, it's the coercive arm of the executive. And then in the constitution you say the police must be independent and it must answer to civilian authority, but, he, but you, you, you put all these other things to evaluate it, to appoint it, to, to, to promote it, to... Uh, for us, uh, actually, 
actually right from the lowest rank, because if you leave the rank of private, we call it constable, to be commissioned, it must be the president to commission you. If you are going to be promoted, we gazetted officers, it's the president. As we started when there were no computers, I saw the computers uh, when I think I'd served for over 10 years in the police. But uh, the first thing they told us that if you put garbage in, expect garbage out. So initially, if you get these fellows into the institution and you are training them in thousands, I think a moderate classroom should be around 24 to 30, okay, maximum. So that there is a feedback from the trainer and the trainee. It, it's in the constitution that no Ugandan should be detained one for more than 48 hours. Don't, it is in the constitution, not even in an act of, of, of police. It is in, in the what? In the constitution. No Ugandan should be detained in an gazetted place. It is in the, these are basic things. And what happens? Every other single day, safe houses are there. Even if the man of your arrest is defined under the law, the way a civilian, because of human dignity, the way police is supposed to arrest you, is defined on how this officer must humble himself to arrest a civilian. It's defined. Do they do that? So, in all intent and purposes, ladies and gentlemen, that we normally gather in these workshops, let us know what we are dealing with. The first thing is not to aspire for constitutional reforms, for whatever reform, is to mobilize a counter-political force and do a new bargain with the state. The police should be the law enforcement armed service of the country that looks out for the interests of the state of Uganda, not necessarily the regime or the government in power. That should be the ideal. So that let's say, for example, if... Uh, an opposition political party wants to hold a demonstration or a meeting, the police should not have a word uh, regarding uh, um, permission or not. It should just basically be monitoring the meeting, the people attending, and maintain the peace of the land. The report also recommends that the inspectorate of government should investigate officers implicated in corruption and those who acquired wealth fraudulently should be prosecuted and dealt with sternly. It recommends to the appointing authority to cherry-pick suitably qualified persons of high moral character, proven integrity and experience to fill key posts in the force and gender balance be considered. And I quote, government should implement a carefully and phased recruitment policy. The process of recruitment should be continuous and regular, not exceeding 500 students a year. The initial training should be a duration of 12 months and a close quotes the study indicates. Specifically, the study implores the Internal Affairs Minister alongside the Public Service Commission to develop guidelines to be followed in the appointment of the Inspector General of Police and Deputy Inspector General of Police. Currently, the president appoints the IGP, who is later rubber-stamped by the Appointments Committee of Parliament. Barely after the 17th Commission of Inquiry handed its recommendations to the executive, the president has gravitated towards appointing military officers as IGP, including General Katumba Omala and General Kale Kaihura, the former held for restoring a modicum of civilian oversight in the force and the latter for militarizing the police. The study recommends for improvement in welfare, specifically accommodation and raising wages of officers. The issue of resources was key. For example, I think at one time, the police force went out to make an appeal to members of the public to see if the resources that would be required would be availed. In some instances, for example, when it came to issues of housing, we had members of the public who are good enough or kind enough to offer land on which some of the police posts stood. 
some of the land re required the development, but in some instances, actually structures were offered to the police. And I think in some instances, some equipment was also offered to the police. Then some of them are walking or even boarding border borders to go and work. And the transport is not provided. Then you find the fellow is there. Of course, some of them work 12 hours, no meals. Okay, uh, during our Fandekare's regime, the police circle was formed and it is trying to address some of the challenges. But it also addresses based on what you have contributed.